Welcome to the Living Unconventionally podcast. I'm Brittany Felix, and every Monday I'll be speaking with someone that realized a traditional life with a soul-sucking 9-to-5 job just wasn't for them. They had the courage to go against what society told them they should want, and now they chase their passions all over the world. We'll discuss their unconventional journey and their exciting and sometimes terrifying travels. Every Wednesday we'll continue that conversation by talking about just how they can afford to travel so often and live a life of freedom most people only ever dream of. Every Friday, I'll answer your questions and offer advice and encouragement to help you start living unconventionally. If you allow yourself to be inspired by my amazing guests, one day I may just be featuring you in your world travels. Today's guest is Sarah Williams from Tough Girl Challenges. And as I kind of briefly mentioned in my little introduction with Sarah in the interview, I have seen Sarah around the podcasting groups for several months now, and she's always been incredibly supportive of other podcasters and incredibly transparent with her podcast and what she's doing. So I am so excited to have her on the show today because her message, for one, is incredible, and we're going to dive really more into that in part two. But what she is doing with her podcast and with her brand is so critical and crucial, especially for women and young women. And not only that, Sarah took 18 months to travel and has accomplished and achieved some amazing things and had some incredible, incredible adventures like summiting Kilimanjaro and completing what the Discovery Channel has called the toughest foot race on earth, which just so happened to take place over multiple days in the Sahara Desert. So we're going to hear about those exciting adventures today. And let's not waste any more time and go ahead and jump right on in with Sarah. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm so excited to talk to you. I've seen you around our podcasting groups for a long time now, for several months. And I have been so intrigued by what you're doing with your own podcast and had no clue that you had this awesome travel experience. So I'm glad to talk with you about that today. Do you mind just giving us a little bit of a background on who you are and what led to that 18 months of travel? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Sarah Williams. I'm based over in the UK. I live up in the Northwest. And about three years ago, my life was very, very different. I actually spent eight years working in banking down in London. And then I got to 32 years old and I just thought, you know what, I can't do this anymore. So I ended up (laughs) quitting my job in March 2013 and heading off for around 18 months. And during that time, I headed to Australia, I headed to Africa to go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro, I went over to South America and backpacked around South America for around four months, I did a ski season working over in Switzerland, and did a whole host of different things, and you know, almost as well, um, starting up the Tough Girl podcast and my company Tough Girl Challenges, so it's been a bit of an evolution over the past couple of, uh, of years. Right, and so what was it that in the end, just, you know, as you were working in finance for you know, like you said, eight years, what was it that just led to that that breaking point where you decided you needed a change? There wasn't one particular incident that happened, I'd say. I think it just sort of gradually sort of built up. And it got to that point where I would be looking outside and or looking out the window and just realizing I hadn't been outside for so long. And I'm a really positive person and I want to be positive and I would give everything 110%. And I was just finding it more and more of a struggle every single day to almost keep up this positivity and I think deep down I just knew it just wasn't it wasn't what I was passionate about it wasn't what I was interested in I was doing it purely for the money I just wanted to make money and I didn't really care how I how I did it and that's why I've been doing it for for eight years when I got to I think 32 30 33 I was just thinking actually do I want to do this for the next 10 15 20 years of my life is this where I want to spend my time and the answer was just no and you know, sort of everything came to a head. And I just thought, actually, you know what, now is the time to get out. Now is the time to leave. And um, yeah, and and then it just all, (laughs) I think sometimes when you make that, that initial decision, things just start to snowball. And then before you know, I'd moved out of uh, the flat that I was living in, I'd moved in with my sister, my brother was over in Australia, and he was like, why don't you come and stay? So I ended up going over to Melbourne and spending some time over there, just sort of planning what I was going to do for the next few months. And so when you set off, did you have the specific 18 months in mind or was it an open-ended trip? Yeah, it was an open-ended trip, to be honest. I, I actually, I was very lost initially. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I didn't know how, 
how long I wanted to, to travel and to explore or, or basically how long I could go without working again. Because I'd, I'd saved up quite a bit of money, I, I knew I could easily afford to take off you know, 12 to 18 months. But I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I always thought that I would go back into employment at some mm-hmm. point once I'd, I don't know, almost got like the traveling out of my system and, and you know, doing all the things that I wanted to do and going to all the places I wanted to, to travel to. And I just thought as soon as I got that out of my system, I will want to come back. I want to get back into the normal nine to five and almost rejoin society. But just sort of hasn't been the case, really. <laughs> right. I don't think and especially for someone like you, I mean, you take adventure to a whole other level. So I don't think that's something that ever really gets out of your system. I think it's just a part of who you are. Definitely. I think I mean, for me, one of my um, one of my big life changing experiences was actually when I was 18 and I had a gap year in between school and university, which is which is almost becoming quite common, especially over in the UK. And so when I was 18, myself and a friend, we headed over to um, Southeast Asia and sort of halfway through our trip, she ended up going home. This was in Thailand and I carried on by myself. So I then did Malaysia, Singapore, east coast of Australia, New Zealand, then back to the UK before heading over to the States to work in the American summer camps. Mm -hmm. And I think that experience massively changed me. Because whenever, you know, going forward, I come across these big challenges or things, I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, I, don't, I don't know what to do here. I'd always think to myself, Sarah, when you were 18, you got yourself from A to B. You dealt with that situation. You survived that. You got through that. You can handle this. And I think it really did instill in me this massive self-confidence and self-belief that actually I could do this because I, I was like, actually, I, I did get around like pretty much the whole world in one piece. <laughs> you just said... <laughs> I mean, I mean, I do look back as well, and I think my, my scariest point was actually, my biggest fear was actually, how do I change planes at Heathrow? It was that I wasn't worried about mm-hmm. anything else. It was That was my biggest fear. And it was almost like as soon as I, I'd done that hurdle, then you just started to do more things. And then as you start to do more things, you start to believe that you can do more things. And therefore, you start saying yes to more challenges and to more adventures. And also, you keep meeting people as well. And everyone's like, oh, you need to go visit here, you've got to see here. So your, your travel list definitely gets a lot longer. Mm-hmm. Right. I think the more you travel, the more you want to travel. The more you check places off of your, you know, wanderlust list, the more they get added. It's, it's kind of never ending. And that's what I love because there, there never really seems to be an end point if you, you know, if you truly are a traveler. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> so do you mind kind of talking about that experience when you're 18? You know, your friend's gone back home and here you are just by yourself and in a foreign country. What's going through your head right then? Yes, what I really remember is, is I got to myself um, down to Malaysia and I was staying in this youth hostel and I'd, I was in this dorm and I was thinking, well, I need to go and do something. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really weird because you always have to force yourself to go outside and just to, you know, because I just wanted to. I wanted to get a feel for, for where I was, what, you know, what it was like, and so just sort of walking around the area that I was staying in. And I had no idea. I can't even remember the area that I was staying in. I was probably just so naive, you know, walking around, finding some food, you know, trying to balance it all out. And I think I just remember that first night sort of going back to the room and just feeling very, very alone. And it was quite a, it's almost, it's a very strange sensation, I think, when you when it's suddenly, it's just you, there's no one else around you, there's there's no friends, there's no family, there's very few people speaking your language, and it's just you in this country, and every single decision comes back to you. Where mm-hmm. you eat, where you go, what you do, everything is on you, and you are responsible 100% for yourself. And it's really, really scary, <laughs> but also it's really, really liberating. And it does, it does take time to build up your confidence. I mean, I remember I was scared about going out see you know seeing things and exploring but then you suddenly get to this point where you're like this is ridiculous I need you know I'm here I've, I'm here to see things I'm here to get outside I'm here to meet people I've actually got to go and do it and you actually have to force yourself to do it otherwise you're just going to spend all your time in you know in youth hostels and you know not meeting people and not seeing the country that you're meant to be exploring and I could almost I mean looking back now as I you know as I carried on through Malaysia into Singapore over to Australia, I could almost feel like my confidence growing. You know, I'd, I'd land in a new place, I'd get off the bus, you'd be like, okay, right, where am I gonna, where am I gonna stay? I mean, and this was back in like 2000, yeah, back in 2000 as well. So I wasn't traveling with a mobile phone. You did have this mm-hmm. old sort of tatty guidebook. 
And you did almost have to rely on the kindness of strangers or people saying, oh, this is where you need to stay. Or, you know, you get to a bus stop, you're like, okay, well, where are the closest hostels? Where do I need to go? How do I move from A to B? And you just sort of learn as you go. And you do just get very comfortable in your own decision making, which has been, especially for me, very, very powerful, especially as I took it into the corporate world. Mm -hmm. So did you ever have anything, and maybe not necessarily even on those travels, but I would think, you know, being young and on your own for the first time really out in the world, did you ever have any unsettling or or scary experiences or anything that just made you kind of reevaluate the way that you traveled? Yeah, definitely. There was a a time I was in Australia, and I was on a real budget. I was on a massively tight budget, and I thought I'd try and save a few pennies by hitching a lift down the East Coast. And I do just remember getting into the car with this guy who I didn't know, you know, I just didn't know at all. I was almost in that traveler bubble where it's like, yeah, everyone you meet is cool and awesome and doing something similar to you. And, you know, he's going to the next place. And I do remember like being in the car and driving along. And I was just thinking, this is really, really stupid. Like, what am I doing? Trying to save, you know, 10, 12, $20 or whatever it is doing this. No one knows where I am. Anything could happen what are you doing? Everything was fine. He was, you know, he was a lovely guy. But I think it's only later when, when, especially when I look back now, I think, goodness, I was actually very, very naive in certain situations Mm -hmm. that I put myself in. I mean, luckily, nothing came from it. But I think it does open up your, your eyes about how you, how how you travel. And, Mm -hmm. you know, even, even like little things mean even I remember being over in, in South America. I don't know, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I would say I was like an experienced traveler, but I'd see like sort of uh, Westerners on the buses and they'd be like, oh my goodness, I've had my camera stolen and I've had this stolen. And I just thinking, well, well where was it? And for me, I'd have, I have this small little backpack which clips onto me at the front. I basically, everything that's important is in it. It stays on my body. My arms are wrapped around it. It doesn't go anywhere at all. It's just mm-hmm. like constantly on my person. And it's weird when you're looking at other people thinking, oh, that was an error. But I suppose the only way sometimes that you can learn is, is through your mistakes. And hopefully the mistakes aren't that big a mistake that you can't, can't learn from them. So for anyone who's going to go out, you know, maybe a female taking their, their first solo trip, they're taking a gap year between grade school and, and university, what kind of tips or pointers could you give them? Things that you've just learned with your experience that maybe you think it might be best if they knew right out of the gate. I'd say one of the first ones is like follow your gut instinct because what happens is you are meeting people all of the time and initially you will make an assessment straight away and you've got to judge them male or female do I feel safe in this person's company what are they like what what sort of vibe am I getting from them what sort of energy are they giving off nine times out of ten your gut is right if you feel uncomfortable in, and I've done this <laughs> you think oh my god I'm being the rudest person in the world and I just thought you know what I do not feel comfortable here. I don't feel comfortable in this situation. Get up, walk away. You don't owe anybody an explanation. Mm -hmm. You don't feel comfortable, walk out of there. I remember once I was in um, a youth hostel and I wish it was in like a mixed dorm. It was like the smallest room with four bunk beds. And bear in mind, I was only 18 and they put me in in a room with like three guys who were all in their late 20s. And I didn't, and I just didn't feel comfortable at all. And so I remember, you know, when I said like, I need to change, you know, change rooms. I'm not being... I'm not being fussy, I'm not being demanding, but actually, I don't want to be a lone girl in a room with three guys, and that didn't make me feel comfortable. So it's following your gut, and also not apologizing to other people if you don't feel comfortable about a situation. I mean, I was in, um, I was in New Zealand, actually, and the bus driver had actually driven, it was in the middle of the night, he'd actually driven past my bus stop, because I was, you know, sort of looking at my watch, this is in the middle of the night, one in the morning, I was thinking, I'm sure we should have stopped at this place I can't remember the name of the town now and so I went to speak to the bus driver I was like oh look I'm really sorry have we you know what, what time are we expected to get to blah 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 and he was like oh no we've passed that like an hour ago and I'm like I'm really sorry but you should have stopped for me and sometimes you've got to fight your corner because I had you know I had a place booked to stay there and he was like well I'm not turning around now and it was like actually sometimes you've got to argue for yourself and just be <laughs> like actually yes you are this is my ticket this is where I'm staying this is where I need to get to this is what you need to do and it is also, to be honest, I want to say common sense, but I do realize that that means a lot of different things to other people. But it is things like not walking around with flashy jewelry on. Mm-hmm. If you are feeling uncomfortable, in, especially some of um, the Malaysian countries, you know, do put a, a fake ring on your finger. Don't feel as though you have to apologize to telling people to go away if they're bothering you or hassling you. 
it's asking people there where are the good places to go, where, where should I avoid? Because like anywhere, there's good areas and there's also bad areas, and it's just being sensible. And generally what you do find is you do meet people while you're traveling who are just you know awesome, awesome people, and you will have an amazing time. But I think the other thing as well is don't let the fear take over, because if you read the newspapers or see the news in any single country, you would just think it's murder <laughs> and chaos and, and mm-hmm. craziness. It's honestly not. Nine times out of ten, people just want to live their life they just want to have a nice time they don't want anything bad to happen so don't let your own fears stop you from going out and having an amazing time okay yeah I think that's fantastic and you know it's something that I do like to talk about fear is incredibly important and I mean I'm sure with the things that you do you understand fear is there for a reason it's to keep us alive like we need to acknowledge the fear and understand the fear but you're right we cannot let it stop us because biologically, we are safest if we just stay in one place where we're comfortable and familiar and there's no danger and there's no risk of anything happening that's going to throw us off balance. But that's not a life worth living. You know, you need to sometimes say, okay, fear, I recognize that you're here. I want to have you. You're good. But you need to just back off at the moment and I'm going to go live my life. And you're right. You cannot just let that control you. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's true, actually, you, you will go through these experiences where there is like a bit of fear and your heart is pumping and you'll learn from them. And next time you come to face that situation, you'll understand how it works, you know, whether mm-hmm. it's crossing borders, whether it's dealing with the police or the bus men and women or, you know, the tourists or the touts or people trying to scam you in the taxi. You just learn from every single, um, every single experience. It does make you a stronger person. Right, right. So I'm interested. I want to hear more about your experience climbing Kilimanjaro. What led to that experience? Was it something you set out specifically to do or an opportunity that just arrived? It was it was an opportunity actually. My my younger sister was turning 30 and so she'd written this list out of 30 things she wanted to do before turning 30 and her big one was going to climb Kilimanjaro and she invited me and said, "You know, do you fancy doing this?" And I was just like, Yes, absolutely. <laughs> of course, it's one of the seven summits. It's the highest freestanding mm-hmm. mountain in Africa. What an incredible challenge. What an incredible opportunity. And, and that's how it came about, really. And we ended up doing the, the wrong eye route, which was about, took about, I think it was about eight days to walk through, walking through this stunning vegetation. There was a small group of us, about eight. And it, well, it was amazing. It was, it was tough going. You know, summit night especially. We're woken up at 11 o'clock in the evening. We started walking at midnight. We got to Gilman's Point, which is the almost like the first point 300 meters away from the summit as the sun was, I always want to say sun setting, but as the sun was <laughs> rising up. And it's just beautiful. You're above the cloud layer. You can see the curvature of the earth. It's just this incredibly peaceful, beautiful, stunning environment. You're sat there drinking a hot drink and then you carry on you know, the next 300 meters, which you think, oh, that'll be super quick. But it's realistically, it's another hour and a half. Wow. And it's not it's not only really sort of challenging on on your body physically, but it's also mentally. And I actually learned a huge amount from that trip because when I was first walking up on summit night, my mind was saying to me, oh, you're so tired. Whose idea was this? Your feet hurt. You're never going to make it. Why did you think you would be able to reach the top of this mountain? You're not fit enough. You're not strong enough. All these horrendously negative thoughts. And I could feel myself slowing down as I was walking. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it happened, but I remember having this almost a stern conversation with myself where I was having to say, Sarah, if you carry on having these thoughts, you're never going to get to the top. And there's nobody else giving you these thoughts, telling you these thoughts, this is you. If you can think it, you can also change what you're thinking. And so I did. I started being more positive. I was like, yes, let's get to this rock. Keep on going. You're really strong. You're strong. You're tough. You can do this. You're going to get there. Keep on going. And it is amazing how just changing your thoughts can almost change like change your body as well. I almost felt like my steps were getting stronger. I was standing up taller. I found it easier to breathe and I had more energy just by being more positive. I think that was one of the key things I took away from, from climbing Kilimanjaro. It's actually, sometimes it's about your attitude and it's about your mindset and just being positive. Not in the ridiculous sense that, you know, everything's amazing, everything's going to mm-hmm. be okay. But actually, in those situations which require it, if you can, you can always choose your attitude. Right. And so what was the preparation like for an excursion like that? To be honest, I was, I th- I was very naive. 
I'd like to think I was relatively fit. I'd run marathons before. I'd run London Marathon five times. I you know, did a lot of walking, did a lot of yoga. But in terms of strength, I wasn't very strong. I'd never done any weights. I'd never done any lifting. I'd never really focused on it. I'd done hill walking before, but I hadn't really done as much training as I would have liked to have done. And looking back now, I think I definitely do more more walking, getting out into the hills, getting out into the mountains. For me, I think I was just going to rely on like my overall general fitness. Mm. And so you said that was an eight-day trip to get there or total? In total, yeah. Okay. So once you got back, you know, you've, you've summited it, you've made the journey back. What was going through your head then? To be honest, I actually started writing it all down. Because in my mind, this is in my 18 months now that I took off after I left my job. And in my mind, I thought, well, if I go back to paid employment and an employer says to me, oh, so Sarah, what have you done with your time off? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. well, I've been to Australia, had this wonderful time in Miami and I went to the Bahamas and swam with dolphins and partied in Ibiza and did all these amazing trips. It's not really going to be that much substance. So I thought, why don't I write a book? Because everyone kept asking me about my experience. So I thought, well, I'll I'll write it all down and I could self-publish it as an e-book, which is what I did. And um, I did really well in Amazon, actually. It was quite, um, it's, been really, it's been really popular. So it's called Kilimanjaro Tips for the Top. And that was actually a really great process, just sitting down and writing down like all the feelings and all the thoughts and going through you know, what I learned from the whole experience. Because even now, like occasionally, I'll, I'll flip back and read through it. And it's amazing, actually, what, you've, what you end up forgetting if you don't mm-hmm. make a note of these little things. So I think sort of journaling or writing stuff down is, is really, really awesome. But it did, lead, it did lead me to think, like, you know, what's next? What's the next challenge that I can go on and do? Right. And so what was that next challenge? Well, the next challenge, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's called the Marathon de Sables, which is French for Marathon of the Sands, which is running six marathons in six days across the Sahara Desert, being self-sufficient and carrying all of your own stuff. And it's a very brutal race. And it was named by the Discovery Channel as one of the world's toughest foot races. So I decided on to do that. So I decided to do that <laughs> challenge. And most people when they hear it, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, why would you want to do that? But I suppose, you know, for, for me it was about it was about the challenge. And I'd run marathons before and I knew a marathon was in my comfort zone. So I knew I could go out and run a marathon. It wasn't going to challenge me to run a marathon again. And because I was starting Tough Girl Challenges, I wanted something to launch Tough Girl Challenges with. I go around a lot of girls' schools and I talk about motivation and challenging themselves and, you know, facing their fears. But I needed to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. So I've been going into schools, you know, talking about running marathons and climbing Kilimanjaro, backpacking and traveling, taking gap years. And actually, I need to do something that would challenge me. And I don't know, sometimes when you do, you do something which is very far outside your comfort zone, you can feel that uncomfortable feeling in the pit of your stomach. Mm-hmm. And actually, sometimes you can forget what that feels like. If you don't go out and push yourself and try new things, you actually forget what it's like. And it's it's really uncomfortable. But if you want to grow and develop as a person, then you've always got to get used to that uncomfortable feeling. And you've got to get used to doing things that that scare you a little bit. Right. And so when did you do that marathon or multiple marathons? I actually did it this year, this April. I was going to say, yeah, this year. So I did it in um, yeah April, April 2016. It was an amazing experience. I went over to Australia and I trained over in Australia for three months. Yeah, then headed out to Morocco. And it was brutal. So, I mean, on the first day, it was we started off, you know, everyone's wearing their backpacks. They start off with this music, ACDC, Highway to Hell. <laughs> There's helicopters flying over the top, blowing the sand into your face. It's 8.30 in the morning. The, the sun is already up. The first day, it was three kilometers flat and then 15 kilometers of sand dunes. Mm. And you're running through these sand dunes. And I'd, I'd done a lot of training, a lot of research. So I was very, very prepared. So I was expecting this. But I could see people left, right, you know, in front of me, just wilting and just being like, are you serious? This is absolutely crazy. And getting to the first checkpoint, it was, it was like nothing you've ever seen before. There was just people sort of collapsed all over the floor. There was people with IV drips in them. People just sort wow. of passed out in the shade. It was, <laughs> it was possibly one of the toughest experiences. I mean, one of, the, one of my the big scary days is actually when they do a double. So in one day, it was running 52 miles in a day. Wow. And that for me, yeah, it's really bad because you say that and I sometimes think, how did I even run 52 <laughs> miles in a day? It's just a crazy, so, so that's like 84 kilometers or something like that. And it's just, 
it's crazy to think about. And that for me was my biggest fear because I'd never run further than a marathon before. So I'd never run further than 26.2 miles. And so when I got past the 30 mile mark, it's like, you know, it's a whole new territory. It's a whole new Mm -hmm. place that I was going, not only physically, but mentally. And I remember at one point I got to the top of this massive sand dune. It was just the sun was starting to go down. It was dusk and I got this massive energy burst. I have no idea where it came from because, I, you know, I'd obviously been on my feet for about 12, 12, 12 hours at this point. And I was looking over about a thousand meters of sand dunes in front of me. And the sand dunes were just going down and flat, down and flat, down and flat. Very few trees. It was just these undulating sand dunes. And I don't know where it came from, but somewhere inside of me, a voice said, Sarah, this is what you have been training for. I remember just like tightening the straps on my backpack, pulling them closer to my body, having a swig of water, putting my music in and just running, just trying to get as far as I could before the sun went down and it went pitch black. And it just thought, this is amazing. And I was thinking, you know, what? I'm going to be able to run the next 20 odd miles like this. I'm going to feel so amazing. It's going to be absolutely awesome. The only problem was about, I'd say about another two hours later, like I had a massive crash. And it was not a crash like, you know, like your body physically sort of just goes, whoa, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And you still got about 12 miles to go. And that's when you go to these incredibly dark places inside yourself. With a lot of these challenges and whether it's traveling or whatever you do, it is your mind. It is, it is that mental resilience. It is that mental toughness. It's that grit. It's that determination, that ability to focus, that is ability to keep going. And I think that sometimes that's what you learn from doing these challenges. So I carried on and there's a photo of me at the finish line. I got in it at sort of five to two in the morning. I remember blowing a kiss to the webcam and there's a photo of me and I look just the freshest. You'd think I'd look haggard and, you know, dehydrated and horrendous, but I just look so fresh. And I remember that feeling of just thinking I was on a massive high. I was just like, oh my God, I feel incredible. I, you know, I've achieved it. I've run 52 miles. I've done it in a day. I haven't stopped. I've kept on going. This is amazing. I, you know, I could do it again. I could do it again. I could keep on going. <laughs> Unfortunately, very quickly afterwards, it, it was possibly the most horrendous you know, night's sleep ever just because I, there was no way to get comfortable. The soles of my feet were just bruised and swollen. And I was just, my legs were aching. My arms were aching. My back was aching. My, every part of my body, even like my little fingers were aching. It was just pain everywhere. But yeah, an amaz- amazing achievement. But I sometimes think, I don't necessarily appreciate these things because it, I'm one of these people who I, I tick things off my list and you know, places I want to see, places I want to go, I tick them off or things I want to do. And it's like, right, on to the next challenge, on to mm. the next adventure. And so sometimes it's strange for me to even reflect back and think, wow, did, did I really do that? <laughs> yeah, because I think you probably have to go to a place mentally where you almost have to just shut everything off and you know really just focus on getting yourself through that particular challenge whatever it is and then later it's it's almost like you've had a blackout where you've just you know you've put your head down and you've gotten it done and then you're like oh wait I'm done now what what just happened (laughs) no absolutely and I mean one thing that I did try and do was I was always very conscious of that and I know how sometimes deep inside of yourself you have to go Mm -hmm. to really get through these things And I thought, actually, I want to make sure that I remember moments. And I'd always be trying to look around and take like mental photographs and just be like, try and remember this moment. Remember what you're feeling, what you're seeing, because you don't want to get to the end of any challenge or any adventure and think, actually, I really can't remember what I've done Mm -hmm. because I've either been looking at my feet for the past 12 hours or the ground for the past 12 hours. And I didn't actually stop to appreciate the journey. Right. And I think writing these books afterwards A, you have to pay attention as you're doing it or you're not going to have anything to write about. But B, it does let you go back and reflect. And like you said, remember those little details that you you would never remember if you didn't have it in print or, you know, in some cases, you know, in audio form or video. Oh, absolutely. It's it's actually it is amazing to to write it all down and just to read back on it. I've actually um, when I was traveling, when I was 18, I had this journal. And it was covered with these like you know, ambition and power words mm-hmm. and travel and adventure, you know, ripped out and laminated. And I, and I kept like a, a daily journal of what I got up to and I'd stick in the, the tickets from my flights or the tickets from the places I stayed or the sites that I'd seen. And it's one of the books that I've still got. And yeah, every once in a while, I'll flick back through and just read, just read little snippets. It's not written incredibly well. It's just, you know, like almost like bullet points. I was here, met so-and-so, did this. 
But even just having those names and be able to read it, the memories do flood back. And I think you, you do forget unless you do record it in some sort of form. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's why I think so many people, and I even have a, an issue with this myself, especially when they travel or when they you know, do anything, we're so absorbed in technology these days and in our smartphones and with taking pictures and taking selfies. But I think that there is a fine balance of being obsessed and too absorbed and using those things to help preserve the memories that you would not be able to remember otherwise. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. It's like, do you know what I think is amazing is nowadays that, oh, I'm sounding really old, like, oh, so what's amazing these days? <laughs> but it's, it was when I was traveling, it was, uh, we didn't have digital cameras, or I didn't mm -hmm. have a digital camera. I had one of those, like, the Kodiak film ones. And so you had to get all your film developed when you came back from your travels. And so it's quite amazing. I mean, I've actually got these big photo albums, like, there's like three or four of them filled with all the photos. Whereas nowadays, it's just so easy to share all your photos on you know, Instagram and Facebook and share those memories as it's happening. Whereas, you know, for me, it was like people had to wait till you came back, got your camera mm -hmm. developed, and then you'd sit down and show people your photos. <laughs> Probably, you know, horrendously boring for them as they go through like, you know, five or 600 photos. <laughs> but isn't there something, though, about having that physical photo? You know, my mom a few years ago moved out of our childhood home and she had all of our photo albums from when we were kids. And there's just something about coming upon those later, you know, sometimes years later, and just sitting through and just flipping those pages and just holding those photos in your hands. I, I do miss a little bit of that. You know, obviously, it's nice and convenient to have everything online, but there's something about a physical photo. No, absolutely. And so of all the places that you have been to, and you may not be able to answer this, most of my guests can't, but do you have a particular favorite that stands out in your mind? Do you know what for me is? It's never really, I've been in some of the most beautiful, stunning places in the world, and they should be ranked as, you know, the, in, the, in the top 10, everybody's top 10. But I, I was there with like the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And then I've also been in some of the most, not when I say horrendous places, I don't mean horrendous. Like, so for example, I was in, I was in Laos, and we'd missed the border crossing into Thailand. We were up in Chiang Mai, we'd run out of money. And it was like, where do we stay tonight? It was literally the equivalent of like a, a pigsty. And it was ridiculous and crazy, but at the same time, that was one of my best experiences of traveling. So for me, it's always been about the people. It's always been about the people that I've met, and, and those are the memories that I have. And it's amazing, actually, when you go back. I remember um, I visited Koh Phi Phi, so this would be back in 2000, just after, I think, The Beach came out with Leonardo DiCaprio. Mm -hmm. And Koh Phi Phi as an island was just this incredible, gorgeous island. You get off the boat, and... It would be this golden sand and sandy beach and there'd be a few sort of market stores and you'd walk through some palm trees and you'd cross over to the other side of the island. And, and Pee-Pee's shaped almost like a, dumb, a dumbbell with like two mountains at, at either side. And in my head, Pee-Pee was this... It, I mean, we had an amazing... I did, I did my diving there, so I became like a rescue scuba diver there. So I did a couple of weeks diving, which was amazing. And we just had this phenomenal time with loads of great people. And Pee Pee, in my mind, has always been this idyllic, gorgeous, incredible, wonderful, wonderful place. And it would, that would be my, you know, my answer of, of my best place to go. And I went back and I was thinking it was about like three years ago or two years ago. And I was just so shocked because in my mind, it, was, it stayed exactly the same. And I remember mm -hmm. getting, off, getting off this tourist boat and it's like, oh, you need to pay a tourist tax. And I was, I was looking around thinking... What, what is this place? Because it was just so built up. There was market stores everywhere, everything. You couldn't see across now to the other side of the island. You had to walk through all these like, built up properties to get through there. And it was just so commercialized and it had just changed so much. And unfortunately, it almost sort of burst my bubble about how mm -hmm. amazing like Co PP was. And I always wished I could go back to how it was you know, the first time I visited it when it was just untouched and, and beautiful. Right. And I think there is something to be said about that. You know, a lot of people tend to go back to the same places over and over again because, you know, maybe they do love it and, uh, you know, maybe it's because it's comfortable to them. But I think it does kind of sometimes it can tarnish those memories and make something that was, you know, so beautiful at one point in time, you know, just like you said, it, it, it just kind of bursts your bubble. And yeah, you can say that you've been back there and, you know, you were not at the time sitting in a cubicle in an office being miserable. But it has kind of just taken away from that first beautiful experience. Yeah. Yeah. So one final question for part one here. For anyone who is in the situation that you are in, you know, maybe they have a corporate job, they've been there for a while, 
Maybe they're working their way up the ladder, they make good money, but it's not anything they're passionate about. It's just strictly a paycheck, and they feel that there is something missing. They want to go have those adventures. They want to challenge themselves and meet new people. They are just so overwhelmed by all of the possibilities, you know, where to go in the world, how to pay for it, what to do while you're there, you know, how to learn the ins and outs of getting visas and and all of this stuff. What do you recommend to them to just help get them started? What's that very first step? I know this is going to sound really simple, but to be honest, the first step is basically it's getting a big piece of paper, a big blank white piece of paper, and just sitting down in a quiet space somewhere for 10, 15 minutes and just writing everything that's in you out. So all of those things that you want to do, all those adventures that you want to go on, all those places that you've heard about that you need to go to, write them down. And then once you finish, you'll have this big old document and you'll be looking at it and just look at it over the next couple of days. And there'll be certain things that keep jumping out at you. It could be San Francisco, it could be Mexico, it could be the Great Wall of China, it could be Morocco, it could be hiking a certain mountain. And then almost start ordering them or getting them in some sort of order or some sort of a priority list. Because I don't want to say to people, you need to go and chuck in your job and go traveling because that's not right for everybody. But people massively underestimate what they can do and what they can achieve by using their weekends, by taking an odd day off here and there. I mean, just an example, my sister's been to 17 countries this year, still working a full-time job. And she been to places like India, Great Wall of China, over to, over to Washington, New York, all these places. But how she's done it is by basically being really, really careful with her holiday. So it's like getting the evening flight on a Thursday. You're landing in the country on a Friday, for all day Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, early flight Monday morning, and straight back to work. So there are always ways around it. And yes, sometimes you can't do that, and that's not possible. And actually, maybe you do need to take off six months, maybe you do need to take off a year. Once you've got your goal written down, it's all about setting a plan. To put the plan in place, you need to have that deadline. I was speaking to um, another lady recently. She's got a family. They're living over in Switzerland, three young daughters. And actually, her and her husband have been talking about going traveling. And so they set a date, which, and it took them two years to save, to plan, to figure everything out before they go and do it. And I think sometimes people think that they need to do it immediately, and it's got mm-hmm. to happen straight away. It doesn't. Because sometimes you do need to plan. You need to start saving. You need to create your own travel pot, your adventure fun fund before you go and have these amazing adventures. And what I would say is traveling or when you're out traveling in places, especially in South America and Southeast Asia, it is so much cheaper than where you're living, especially if you live in the United States, the United Kingdom. By saving your money, it will go so much further when you're out in these other countries. And I think people don't necessarily realize this, that actually things like I mean, for me, I used to make my lunch every day. If I didn't make my lunch, it would be £8, £10 a day. Mm-hmm. Suddenly you add it up and it's you know, £50, $50 a week. Add that up over a month, 200 Add it up over a year. It really, really does add up. There's no one correct route or no one correct way to get to where you want to get to. There are so many different ways that you can achieve it. But it's just about how serious you are about doing it and taking those first steps. But the first step is just, Try and decide what it is you want to do and narrow it down. Once you've got that, putting deadlines in, making it a date, and things will start to happen and things will start to unfold and you will get there. If it, you know, if it means enough to you and if it's just, you know, oh, wouldn't it be nice if someday, mm-hmm. then that's never really going to happen. But if you can get really specific and be say, do you know what, I want to go visit San Francisco, I want to go and explore Alcatraz, I want to do X, Y, and Z, whatever it may be. I'm just looking at my vision board now. <laughs> <laughs> You can make it happen, but it is all about have a goal, make a plan, and start taking action. And that wraps up part one of my interview with Sarah Williams from Tough Girl Challenges. I think the name of Sarah's business fits her perfectly. She is absolutely the definition of a tough girl. I can't imagine doing one marathon, let alone six marathons in six days in the Sahara Desert. (laughs) So I hope her story inspired you. And if you would like to learn more about Sarah, you can absolutely do so by checking out the show notes on my website, where I'm going to have links to everything that we talked about in today's episode, including Sarah's multiple books that she has written about her many adventures. To find those, all you have to do is go to livingunconventionally.com 
forward slash episode 124. Of course, those are the actual numbers, 124. And as usual on my Monday episodes, I have two invites to extend to you. One is to come back on Wednesday where we are going to hear about Sarah's business, Tough Girl Challenges, exactly what that is, what she does with it to help women and especially young women. But we're also going to hear about the mistakes that she made while building her business that others can learn from and avoid when starting their own businesses. She's also going to talk about the ways to effectively build up your social media following. The second invite is, of course, to come and join all of us in the Living Unconventionally Facebook community, over 450 members who are fed up with living a traditional lifestyle. They want more adventure. They want more freedom. They want more choices. And they know that travel checks off all of those boxes. So if these sound like people that you want to get to know a little bit better, come interact with us in that Facebook group. Participate in the daily themes that we have. Soak up the resources that I share in there every single week and build friendships with people that you never know. You may actually meet up in person when you're on your travels in the future. All you have to do to join us is click the link that will be in the show notes that I mentioned previously, or just simply go to livingunconventionally.com forward slash Facebook. That is going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for joining me, and I cannot wait to have you back on Wednesday to hear the rest of Sarah's insights. Have a fantastic day.